Welcome, everybody. We've got a wonderful turnout this morning. Um, uh, I'm David Leonhardt with the New York Times. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel, and then we're going to dive right in. Obviously, there's no shortage of great stuff for us to talk about about the 2012 campaign. Um, the idea here is to, to give you all a little bit of some of the backstory of what goes into modern campaigning. Um, and in the course of doing that, we're also, of course, going to talk about the 2012 campaign. We're going to talk about some of the larger forces in American politics as well. And then um, we're going to open it up to you all um, and uh, get you involved in the conversation. So starting down at the far side is Mike Murphy, um, a longtime Republican strategist, um, was, was part of the, the really energetic 2008 John McCain campaign. Um, uh, has worked for a lot of the Midwestern governor, Republican governors who've won in purple or even blue states. Uh, correct me if I get the names wrong, but John Engler and Tommy Thompson and, and many others. Um, uh, um, most recently worked as part of, um, uh, well, not as part of, but connected with the Jeb Bush campaign um, in 2016. Part of would be a felony. So let's yes, that's that's why I realized that. I was about I to get you in legal PAC. trouble. Never talk to anybody. S super PAC that was pro-Jeb. Um, and next week we'll be launching a podcast that you can find on iTunes, Radio Free GOP. Um, next to Mike is um, Jan O'Malley Dillon, who is a founding partner at Precision Strategies. Um, before that, she was the deputy campaign manager for the Obama 2012 campaign and was the Battleground States director in 2008. Um, he did okay in Battleground States, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he even won some that aren't really even Battleground States anymore. <laughs> um, uh, next to Jen is Lynn Vavrick, who's a professor of political science at uh, UCLA. We're not here to talk about higher education, but I, can't, uh, but I can't resist pausing for just one second and saying that UCLA is arguably the most impressive university in the United States today. It is, in some ways, it resembles the City College of New York of old. It is one of the few elite universities in American higher education that is truly diverse in every way, not just racially, but also economically. Um, something like 40% of the undergrads at UCLA uh, receive Pell Grants, um, which is a remarkable number. At uh, many other state, top state and private universities, that number is 10%. Um, Lynn is also the co-author of The Gamble, a really wonderful book about the 2012 campaign with John Sides. And she contributes to something at the New York Times called The Upshot, which sounds really fascinating. Uh, and next to me and next to Lynn is Sasha Isenberg, who is a Washington correspondent for Monocle, um, is also a contributor to Bloomberg Politics. Sasha and I met uh, in a van uh, covering the 2008 uh, Edwards campaign. Which is probably also a felony. <laughs> northern New Hampshire, as Sasha said, we dined at the, at the finest Mexican restaurant in northern New Hampshire. Uh, and then when we reconnected at the uh, GOP debate that year in Michigan, uh, when Mike's candidate, John McCain, was I think at about 3 or 4% in the polls, somewhere hovering around the margin of error, um, uh, I said to Sasha, who do you think is going to win the, the Republican nomination? This was 2008. And he said, John McCain. And I said, are you crazy? And he said, uh, I can tell you a very compelling story about every other candidate above McCain in the polls and why he won't be the nominee and no story like that exists for McCain. So Sasha's going to share some of his predictions about 2016 <laughs> for us this year, and we'll hold him accountable in four years. So let's, let's dive right in. And Jen, I'm going to start with you. There is now, uh, there is almost kind of nerd glamour around campaigns, right? That somehow there are people in back rooms, and they know what cars we drive and what podcasts we listen to, and therefore they know exactly how we're going to vote. And it's, it's sort of, it's been described in many ways as wizardry. Can, can you demystify that a little bit for us and tell us what really is new in this science of campaigning that actually matters? And, and what isn't as, as sexy as, as some of the mystery makes it seem? Yeah, I like to um, talk about campaigns and data in particular as the non-sexy side of what we do. Um, and I think people hear, oh, big data. You know, we are going to know every single thing about everything you do at every moment, and that's how we're going to talk to you. And the reality is it's a, a lot less glamorous than that. I think fundamentally we saw in 2008 and 2012, I would say, really seismic changes in political campaigning. Um, you know, the use of 
data, the use of technology, the way we would communicate with people, um, the platforms we could communicate, and how we could have direct relationships with voters and activists in a way that we hadn't been able to uh, at such scale. So there certainly was a lot of impact then. I think in 2016, we're seeing evolutions of that, and certainly there's very different platforms people are communicating on, so many more now, that it changes how we communicate and the ways we do that, but I don't think we're actually gonna see seismic changes this cycle and, and haven't really seen it from a practitioner standpoint. But when I think of data, when I think of fundamentally what President Obama was able to do in the campaign, he really spent a lot of time prioritizing how we can engage with people by understanding more about them and putting it in systems that allowed us to to know more about people based on what they want to share with us. So, you know, certainly we had voter files, we had a way to understand what kind of voter history people have, the Democratic Party has spent a lot of resources over the year really honing that, and there's a lot of information we have to build on. But we also were able to add to that the kind of engagement that allowed people to tell us what they wanted to hear, how they wanted to hear. Did they want to talk to us on the phone? Were they really interested in volunteering? Would they rather um, just communicate with us on Facebook? Um, what issues they cared about? And because we had that conversation and a two-way conversation, our data was really rich and enhanced and allowed us to communicate to people more effectively, allowed us to do it in a way they wanted us to communicate, which was really important. It allowed us to not look at people as monolithic groups, but actually, um, you know, are they persuasion targets? Are they motivation targets? Are they people that um, want to be a donor or want to volunteer? And what that meant for us in terms of how we communicated. So, you know, under the hood, it was so valuable um, and critical to the president's success. But that was also because from the top, he prioritized the importance of actually um, engaging at a grassroots level and the importance of doing that on the ground, doing that through digital, doing that through traditional advertising. And because of that, we built the systems that allowed us to do that as effectively as possible. I feel like there's this conventional wisdom, which I think is right, which is that in, um, in 2000 and 2004, the Republicans were ahead on a lot of this stuff. And now, in, more recently, Democrats have been ahead. First of all, Jen and then Mike, do you share that conventional wisdom? And if you do, what do you think the difference was? If, if, the, if the Obama campaign in 2012 was better than the Republicans about this kind of stuff, um, the Obama campaign won by four points. Um, uh, how many of those four points, if any, um, could we attribute to those sorts of more effective data-based campaigning? Impossible questions to answer. <laughs> um, I, I think I certainly agree that the Republicans were ahead. I think that the Democratic Party saw that we had a lot of work to do and we had to get more sophisticated. I think we also, as a party, have a, a different kind of um, priority when it comes to building campaigns and the tactics that we use. We have to spend a lot of time communicating to our voters to uh, ensure that they turn out to vote. We have to spend a lot of time educating, especially on the voter, um, the voter laws that are changing. And so our requirement foundationally uh, is a heavier lift to get to voters and to, to have the tools that allow us to be more efficient. So I, I do think, um, you know, with the president, we were able to start and see that there was value in this. He prioritized funding um, programs that, you know, aren't always thought of. I mean, it, traditionally, you'd see the sort of grassroots side of campaigns as the afterthought. Um, you know, the, the, uh, I'm a field person, so I have a chip on my shoulder that I'll carry forever. Um, but, you know, we're, we would be funded less. We would be funded later into the fall. You wouldn't spend the time building an organization on the ground, having offices everywhere. Um, so he really kind of changed that mold and said, no, this is important because he thought that was important to the campaign and we're going to put the resources behind it. And then once we saw the, the value of it and the efficiency of it, we kept building and building on that. Um, so I would argue we have to do that as a Democratic Party to continue to reach the voters that we need to. Um, but we also have seen the value of that. But you can't let it stay static. Certainly in this environment, you have to keep building and enhancing it based on the current environment. Mike, Mike do you agree? I think I misspoke. I said you are part of the 08 McCain campaign. But yeah, of course, I you were, I didn't you were Wait, was 2000. You yeah. were the 2000 McCain campaign. Uh, I was a sympathizer in 08, but my friend Mitt Romney had run his governor's race in Massachusetts, so I stayed neutral. Right. I was originally going to run the Romney campaign in 2008. I, I would say this. It is both true and misleading. Uh, first of all, I'd observed that all the data power in the world couldn't have done the miraculous political lift that only our mighty Republican Party has managed to do, which is pull a kind of a clown out of reality show television and make him nominee. <laughs> that, that was done with no technology at all. <laughs> um, uh, other than Twitter, but fundamentally being what in the movie business they call a pre-aware title, already famous, uh, worth billions of dollars. That's why you see Iron Man 14, not new movie concepts, because it's cheaper to advertise something people already have heard of. But I think Jen's point is essentially correct. Though I, my, 
I would say this, the most overrated thing in politics is tactics and process, which gets a tremendous amount of attention. And it's not unimportant. But now it's become like big time sports and the consultants are coaches and there's all this talk and everything's on cable TV and you know, I'm part of all that. But it's a bit overrated. The reason the Democrats have been better at technology beyond the focus I think their campaign management folks have had, which I applaud, is the center of gravity of their natural constituency is different. The average Republican primary voter is older. You know, if you want to know something about the center of gravity of a, of a party, take a look at the communications medium that many of the members organically gravitate to without being told to go there. With my party, it's AM radio, which isn't going to exist in seven or eight years. With the Democrats, it's this fad the kids are into called the interweb. So it was just a natural thing that you go where your voters naturally are, that the Democrats were incentivized to take advantage of digital technology which has revolutionized politics. I have more computing power in this unfortunately Chinese-made smartphone, uh, though designed in America mostly, than the Apollo program did when it put a man on the moon. So the result of that new digital world we're in, which has had huge ramifications from retail with Amazon to the way you consume media with all the streaming television you can get, is we now know everything about everybody. Because digital is very good at recording data, and it gives you a lot of power to shift through data and look for patterns. And the Democrats have clearly embraced that on the digital side quicker than we did. And it has been an advantage to them, particularly in democratizing fundraising, low dollar fundraising. If you were to go to the Clinton campaign up in Brooklyn a few months ago, and you were a reporter, they would have fed the process interest you have and said, let, let me show you our big, important internet world. And you'd go in and you'd see a room of a zillion 25-year-olds on terminals uh, typing away. 75% of them are working on fundraising appeals. When I was in college at Georgetown, we used to go over to the RNC where they had a phone bank where they'd pay us three bucks money to call little old ladies in Oklahoma and ask them for $10 to help Ronald Reagan stop the Russians from invading Kansas. Now you go to the RNC, the phone bank's gone, and you have 100 kids on computers doing digital fundraising appeals. So everything changes and nothing changes. So I would just, the Democrats have been smart to follow the incentives in their party, and we have been dumb to not have the strength to break the age incentives in our party that concentrate on digital technology, but we are catching up. I just finish up by saying all this stuff is an amplifier, which is vital in politics, because you have a limited number of resources. You've got so much money, so much luck, and so many days. So digital can do tremendous things to amplify and create support. But I would bet a new car that in 2008, and, and uh, after over a few drinks, I've gotten David Axelrod to agree to this, that if Obama did not have the internet, he still would have won because the content was superior. Sasha, you helped create the conventional wisdom I described with your book, right? And, and which is a wonderful book. Uh, remind us of the title. The Victory Lab. The Victory Lab, which, is, which came out right as the 2012 campaign was happening and sort of sketched the whole history of this through fascinating social science and all kinds of things. Do you see any signs, and even if you don't, um, do you expect it to happen that Republicans will catch back up? Or do you expect that Democrats are going to have this as something of an advantage um, for the rest of the decade? Yeah, I think for the near term, um, I, I have trouble seeing. I agree generally with, with Jen's history. I, haven't read my structure of scientific revolutions recently, but you know I think that there was that the period between like you know 06 and 2012 where there were radical changes in um, in in innovations in a lot of the mechanics we're talking about, and now we're back to a process of 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 I think sort of period of incremental changes. But there's a huge cultural burden to um, I mean you know Jen started as a field person as she said um, that. Part of the big challenge for a party or a movement is making sure that whatever statistical modeling, targeting, research you have in your headquarters is actually being used in the field by people who are engaging in contact with voters or making decisions about who's getting a piece of direct mail, who's getting a phone call, who's getting a digital ad in front of them. And so one of the things that the Obama campaign did that um, in 2008 that will have impact for a generation was, you know, by the end of the campaign, there were like 3,000 fields, people working in field offices around the country, 3,500, there's a you know, large campaign staff, many of them in states. And so the end user of these innovations that were produced in the headquarters in Chicago were 
22-year-old kids, 24-year-old kids who are responsible for a couple of towns or a county in a swing state. And in 2012, those kids were running congressional campaigns, and now they're running statewide campaigns, and they've become uh, demanders of that the party, national campaigns, the party committees, consultants and vendors produce tools that were once uh, fairly rarefied and now are sort of needed, seen as needed as, as sort of baseline entry to do any form of, of campaign work. And there has not been that kind of um, creation of a, a generation of sophisticated users on the Republican side. And I think that that is something that, um, you know, there, there may have been the prospect that uh, if a different candidate had won this year, I mean, Cru Cruz's campaign was very much focused on, on certain types of grassroots and volunteer-driven communications. It's possible that if Ted Cruz were the nominee this year that you would, you would have a, a, a sort of um, a transformation in the, in the generational priorities of, of, of young Republican uh, operatives. And, but, you know, if it doesn't happen in a presidential election. The other point I would just make quickly to go back to the the 2000, 2004 being a period of Republican primacy and, and 2008, 2012, is I think we sort of underestimate how radically different presidential reelection campaigns are from every other institution that exists in, in campaigns. And, um, you know, there actually wasn't as much of a gap in 2004 between what uh, the smartest people in Democratic or lefty politics knew was possible and what the smartest people in Republican and righty politics uh, knew was possible, but um, the fact that the Bush campaign and the RNC were effectively fused for 18 months and could invest in what looks a lot like an R&D program in a corporation as opposed to sales um, was very different, and the people in the carry world who were on to basically the same type of things that the Bush people pulled off could just never get stuff done, and you know, Obama had that advantage in 2012. Um, and I think that one of the things we saw this year was both the Clinton and, and, and Jeb Bush campaigns starting in early 2015 were thinking about their structure and organization in a general election in a way that most campaigns usually are running basically two separate elections. We, we do what it takes to win the primary. We don't spend a dime that could yield anything beyond a delegate that wins us the nomination. Then we start over from scratch in June. And often that's too late to basically start an, an R&D uh, program. Lynn, bring us up to 2016. So one of the things that you and your fellow political scientists talk about is this idea of fundamentals, right? That we in the media uh, talk about who gave the best speech and who has the best ad, and we <laughs> vastly exaggerate the importance of all those things. And you tried to pull us back to reality. Um, I would assume you would say the fundamentals of, of uh, pretty good, if not great, economic growth and uh, an incumbent president who has positive approval ratings um, suggests that even without the Donald Trump sideshow, Hillary Clinton would be a favorite. Is that right? And what is that brief description missing? Yeah, I think that's close to right. Um, I, I like to think of this, I think the amplifier is a really good uh, way to think about it. Um, I think about it like a stage. And so the presidential election is going to play out in front of us on stage, but the backdrop and the setting and the scenery, that all gets put in place before the campaigns actually start. And that's, that background and stage setting really matters. And that's what David's talking about are the fundamentals. So what's going on with the state of the economy? Uh, do people think the country's generally moving in the right direction? How's income doing? And what's most important is not the level of those things, but the change in those things. So in some way, do people have a general sense that the tide is rising and everyone is doing better, the country is doing better, or do they have this sense that things are on the decline? So 2016 is slightly complicated because the growth is probably gonna be there, but it's not going to be huge. Um, and we have this party facing their third term in office. So this is an unusual occurrence, and it's since the New Deal been historically very difficult for parties to get that third term. And so depending on who you talk to, uh, they might tell you that even though all the fundamentals are pointing in the right direction for the Democratic Party, the fact that they're contesting for their third term is such a drag that the growth in the economy is not enough to overcome that. Um, my view is slightly more optimistic uh, for the Democratic Party than that. Um, I think that I would agree 
with you if I had to put money down right now, just based on the scene setting um, and you know, sort of all the stuff that Mike talked about, like what is going on and what's the package that each candidate is gonna present to you in terms of messaging and ideas, um, I'd have to give a slight edge to the Democrats. Okay. So <laughs> let's spend a couple minutes beating up on each of the parties, um, which is always fun. And we're going to start with the Republicans because, in fairness, they, they have more problems right now, right? I mean, uh, um, uh, Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, senior figures in the Republican Party, as John Dickerson has noted, have not recently been willing to clear this bar of even saying their candidate is qualified. Mike, you talk about this fight in the Republican Party between the mathematicians and the priests. I get the sense you're more sympathetic to the mathematicians, yes. but correct yeah. me. The mathematicians look at the numbers and say, hey, guess what? America isn't as conservative as older white voters are. America isn't as conservative as we want it to be. We need to acknowledge that reality and deal with it. And the priests say, if only we make our case strong enough and nominate a true conservative, um, all these voters are going to come out of the woodwork and, and we're going to win. The missing so, millions, as Ted Cruz would call them. The missing millions. They're on Jupiter, but they're going to come back <laughs> if we have the right... So how does the Republican Party get out of this? The closest well, model says, we have is the Democratic Party from the 70s and 80s. How does the Republican yeah. Party get out of this? Let me just preface my remarks by quickly addressing one thing, because I thought you made an excellent point. The one thing that's changing, though, in the academic studies is the number of persuadable voters is shrinking. And part of that is just demography. We're going to have in this election, give or take a percentage point, 30% of the electorate that is non-Caucasian and the Republican Party will not really compete for. So we have to win 50% of the vote competing with 70% of the market share, which means we're like the baseball team that only bats five innings. And some, we better be incredibly good at home runs. It's becoming statistically impossible. So to your point about what do we have to do to change this, there's no easy answer. The problem is the short-term incentives, and the, the, politics is a market, and the short-term incentives among the 20, normally it's 21 million this year because it went on forever, 28 million people who vote in Republican primaries, Trump rewarded those incentives with the political mood we had now. You know, people talk, I was on a panel yesterday, the Trump voters, the Trump this, the Trump that. There really are no Trump voters. There are Republican primary voters who are in a Trump mood. Many people who voted for Trump last time voted for George W. Bush or Mitt Romney or other people. So it, it's not like there's this planet that landed with special new people. They were in that mood. That was the grievance spike of the moment. It wasn't the majority of the primary vote. It's down around 42%. So Trump won with a minority plurality. But those were the incentives in the primary. And in the Bush campaign, uh, we've never been prouder of losing, which is something somebody, I've been paid 30 years to win elections. I've never said that before. Uh, normally, I go into an incredible fetal position meltdown uh, thing, but we, we said from the beginning, we're, and Sasha alluded to this, we're going to try to run a winning Republican general election campaign that reflects who our candidate is, and that means we're going to have a hell of a damn time in the primary. So we're trying to raise a ton of money and muscle our way through. Jeb actually once said, in the politics we have now, you almost have to lose the primary to win the general election. I think we've now proved that corollary, because <laughs> the guy who won the primary, I think, is extremely likely to lose the general election. So how do we change it to, to finish up? It's not easy. We, I said yesterday, and Vin Weber kind of backed me up, who's an experienced practical politician, we got to look at the whole way we nominate. Because nominations left up to our primary voters don't necessarily reflect the self-interest of the party. I'd rather have 100 political bosses from around the country who make a rational decision for the nominee, which is the way we used to do it until <coughs> George McGovern screwed it up for all of us by small d democratizing the primary process. We, we've got to push our primary voters out of their comfort zone, which is very, very hard to do, and everybody's failed so far. After Trump loses in the rubble pile, uh, maybe there will be a reexamination of this, but many of the same warlords Trump's an aberration. He'll be gone. But there will still be the same schism between grievance candidates and accretive conservatives, and that war will continue. And don't underestimate the team grievance and the number of actual primary voters they have. Ted Cruz, organically, has more delegates on the floor in the coming convention than Trump does, by far. Trump's, that's a shotgun marriage convention. Two-thirds of those delegates don't really want Trump. And Cruz would probably win an open brawl there, though it's, it's open to see. So we've got a lot of lifting to do. The last thing I'd very quickly say is, you know who Trump is really screwing, I believe, beyond us? The Democratic Party, because I think they're going to win for free. And it's never good when you win a presidential election, essentially, for free, because the other side melts down. 
Isn't it, to me, the simplest answer, and I would invite anyone to disagree with this or agree with it, is the Republican Party needs to move to the left. When the Democratic Party lost five of six presidential elections from the 60s through the late 80s, it responded by moving to the right. And the Republican Party is now well to the right of where the American people are on a bunch of issues. Doesn't it have to figure out a way to move somewhat to the left? I'm not sure it needs to be ideological. Like sometimes I think about this and I say, maybe it's just the package of things that we talk about um, as parties or as the Republican Party, that that package um, needs to be expanded a little bit to include some things that these new demographic groups that we want to get into um, might be interested in. And maybe those mean taking positions that are more to the left, uh, but maybe there is a conservative position on some of these issues that could be appealing. Yeah. But the fact is, is that you know a, that conversation is not happening uh, for I think a lot of the reasons that you were saying that it's just not a, it's not a part of the group that that your party's trying to appeal to. Yeah, I would just say it's less about, I think, a swing to the left than a more modernized conservatism. Our problem, you see, the Democrats fight on class war. What drives Democrats crazy is that poor people vote Republican. It's just, that, that's, it's not in their economic interest, they would say. We fight a culture war. And so now we have Trump, who's kind of the laboratory animal that's escaped in the culture wars, <laughs> taking it into racism. I mean, we have to say that about Trump. That's the truth. You know, it's inconvenient in a presidential election, but a lot of his appeal is racist. <coughs> Every villain Trump has is either a Mexican trying to break into the country or some enigmatic Chinese diplomat who's outwitting the fools at the State Department. <laughs> so on the Democratic side, um, they're to the point where the general election, and you know, Jen can, of course, and will disagree if, if, <laughs> if she feels otherwise, but the national election is looking more like a Democratic primary. So they're more and more about turnout. Our problem is persuasion. You get all the Republicans in a presidential election, you lose. In the off-year elections where a third fewer people vote, we do all right. But it's, uh, so the other incentive problem is we go win the off-year elections with the usual stuff. The Democrats go in the off-year election trying to turn out all their presidential voters who don't show up and they lose. <clears throat> then we go to the general election where there aren't enough Republicans and we can't persuade anybody. They do an excellent job of turning out that presidential constituency, which looks a lot more Democratic than Republican, and they win. And we've had this yo-yo going on for a while. Now, how those cycles break, I don't know. Let's hold the off years for a minute. We'll come back to that when we talk about the Democrats' problems. But Jen, <laughs> what concerns do you have about 2016? Uh, and to put a fine point on it, how much do you share this concern, the, basically the Brexit concern, which is that there is essentially a large and overwhelmingly white group of voters who have still remained somewhat loyal to the Democrats. As my colleague Nate Cohn has pointed out, a lot of n white, lower income voters in the North have remained very loyal to Barack Obama and the Democrats, which is another way of saying the Democrats could lose those white, lower income voters, middle income voters at some point. How much do you worry that the Democratic connection to those voters in particular, or to another group if you worry about it, could be loosened in 2016 or after in presidential years? Yeah, you know, I think 2016 is actually quite tough for Democrats because I think on the one hand, you see Donald Trump and you think, how on earth could this man be president? And so, you know, we're doing all right. We have more money. You know, we obviously have the president. We have a lot going on for us. And so we kind of slow down a bit. And I think that we can't, we can't one, can't afford to do that. Two, we can't make a playbook of what's about to happen because we haven't been able to make a playbook of what's happened to this point. Um, and because, you know, fundamentally, I think our primary has shown that there are voices within the progressive side that did not feel like they were heard by um, our current nominee and by the party as a whole. And so, you know, some of those voices obviously, um, you know, found their home with Bernie Sanders. And I think for us as a party, we have to really figure out how do we open our dialogue so that those voices have have a voice in our party. I think that's one of the Republicans' biggest problems. It's not just Donald Trump, who is obviously a significant problem, but the generations that are feeling like the Republican Party isn't open to them, whether they're young, whether they're from a, a different um, you know, country, whether they're um, from a different background. And so you know, for us, I think we have to really think about how do we, one, you know, bridge the gap that existed in the primary and pull people back together. Now, you know, I'm not of the belief that that is um, an impossible lift. We're already seeing the movement of Bernie supporters uh, to Hillary um, in far dramatic numbers, uh, or, well, not maybe not dramatic, but more dramatic than the previous two um, unity uh, times. 
but we also have to think about what that means for us for the future and how do we, how do we actually fundamentally come up with a way that we can move forward and have a strong voice for these progressive young millennials but also across the board. Um, you know, uh, uh, people that are feeling like they, they don't have a path forward, that they no longer have American dream, that they, you know, their kids for the first time in their lives are not gonna have a better life than they had before. And there's a lot of fear that's real that we have to address and find a path forward on both sides. I think for the campaign itself in 2016, you know, there is a lot at stake clearly. Obviously we have a lot of institutional challenges trying to run on um, you know, a, a democratic president's, uh, th you know, third effort. But, um, you know, we have to have our game plan and we have to set that very clearly, which I think the Hillary um, Clinton campaign has done. And we have to make sure that we're very focused on that. And that does require us having very deep, very clear conversations with these different audiences that we have to bring into the fold, but also say that, you know, we hear them and we're doing something about it and here's what we can move forward with. So I, I think we have a lot of work to do as a party. I think we have a lot of work to do this election. I think we also have to make sure that people don't feel like this is a walk. Um, and we have to really engage people to, to recognize that there is a voice in this process. And I think what Brexit has shown us is that, you know, I mean, the, the stories of people the next day, you know, Googling what is the EU and, you know, uh, what is Brexit and what does it mean? I mean, you know, people were saying they didn't think their vote mattered or they didn't really understand the repercussions. And that is our responsibility as a campaign, as a party, as a candidate, to communicate what's at stake, to do it clearly, to, to make people understand what the choice is and to ensure that they participate. And I think that's one of our biggest challenges. And when we get to the off year, we can talk about uh, where we struggle on that, more importantly, outside of presidential. Lynn or Sasha, what do you see as the biggest risk, um, uh, not necessarily 2016, but include that if you want, over the next two or three presidential elections to the Democratic coalition? I think it's replicating the volunteer coalition that Obama had in 2008 and 12. Um, we know a whole lot about what it takes to mobilize voters, and part of the advantage that Obama had was um, not just that he was overwhelmingly popular among uh, African Americans, young voters, um, but uh, in terms of their their support for him, when when given a choice between him and him and Romney or him and McCain, but that their enthusiasm, which doesn't manifest itself in extra votes, but did manifest itself in in activism, allowed him to uh, uh, support and sustain the type of field infrastructure that Jen talked about uh, having built. And we know from a whole lot of uh, experimental research. Like, we know how to turn an infrequent voter into a voter. This is not a mystery anymore. Um, and we know that, you know, high quality face-to-face -face interaction from a volunteer uh, at the doorstep, um, uh, most likely when that person is of the same demographic group or from the same geographical community as the voter they're talking to, um, uh, they, that is the sort of gold standard to, to turn a non-voter into a voter. And basically, you do that 14 times and you create a vote. Um, and there's now much better. Uh, it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult, though, to get people uh, trained and in the right locations to go out and actually do that and build systems where um, they know what they're doing and they're held accountable and stuff's measured and they do it well. And, the, and um, uh, I think that the problem for Hillary Clinton is she might get to 96% support among African Americans or whatever it was, and the same support among uh, you know, 18 to 29 year olds, and the same level of support among Latinos, but uh, if there is a lack of enthusiasm within those groups, the, the field offices in, in battleground states will just have fewer people in them. And that means that there are fewer doors that are knocked on and fewer phone calls that are made. And the ability to mobilize that coalition, uh, there, there really are some things in politics that you can't do with money. Apparently some of it is advertising against Donald Trump successfully. Um, mm -hmm. But the other part of it is mobilize voters. Um, we know that unpaid volunteer contact is better than paid contact. And I think that's a problem for Democrats, um, uh, certainly this fall, if, if what we see from polls about, about a, a sort of lack of investment in, in Hillary Clinton's candidacy, even if people are invested in, in beating Donald Trump and in, in winning in November. Lynn, anything you want to add? I would just say quickly that um, I would worry about, I've heard so many people say, 
oh, you know, the, the Democrats now own the Latino vote. And I think that resting sort of on that assumption is a danger. Um, and I, I think people just equate ethnic groups are all the same. And, but there are nuances, I think, in the, in the Latino community um, that could make it very different uh, from, for example, you know, the black vote, which Sasha just said is routinely democratic. Um, and so I think this Trump opportunity, this is like a real opportunity for the Democratic Party to, to make the case uh, to the Latino community that this party is never, no matter, no matter what your ethnic heritage is, is never gonna have your back. Um, and, and failing to capitalize on that, I think, because you think it's just gonna happen forever is a risk. So if I said I think there's a 90% chance that Hillary Clinton beats Donald Trump, would any of you argue that it should be higher or lower? Well, I have a caveat. Um, I believe the 90-20 thing if it's Trump. I'm not sure at the end on election day it'll be Trump. What percentage odds do you put on Trump being the nominee? Uh, I think 75% at the convention, but another 25% chance or 20% chance that after, he's now got a structural seven day problem in the polls because it's settling in. The Democrats are going to the Democratic nominee. The Bernie voters will be with Hillary, I believe. Uh, I don't know how many weeks of being a loser he's built to take. And then he's he just quits? And yeah. Trump and quits one day? Yeah, he's Trump. Why not? People keep saying, well, candidates never do that. Well, he's not a candidate. He's Trump. <laughs> you know, it's like being Charlie Manson's Foxtrot instructor. You teach him a few moves. <laughs> oh, he's yeah. doing okay. You're like, Charlie's making some progress. Your name tries to stab you in the eye. <laughs> so he's Trump. You cannot predict Trump. So just because the political rules are, you know, uh, world affairs must be conducted in French, the language of democracy. No, he's never been to that college. Never been to the Aspen Ideas Festival, okay? Trump, <laughs> Trump's Trump. He may just say, you know what? They're not supporting me. I can't be a loser in my brand. So I got to get out of this thing. So I'm going to blame the party for not raising any money for me and go ahead and pick somebody else on September 12th. Really narrow question. If he quit yeah. on September 12th, what happens? Is his name locked on the ballot or no? Well, it's a huge lift, but we'd have a better chance of winning <laughs> depending on what will be an amazing five days when, when the College of Cardinals has to come together and pick a nominee. <laughs> uh, Senate, if I said 50-50, um, do any of you think that's wrong? Uh, do you think one party's clearly favored to hold the Senate? Jen? That's a loaded question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think 50-50. I think obviously, we, Democrats had a good night in uh, Colorado last night um, you know, with Republican Tea Party candidate winning. You know, I, I think we have some really strong opportunities on the Senate side, but it is certainly not going to be a lock, and it really um, has an impact on the battleground states or the presidential side. Um, so. And House, if I said the Democrats have a 20% chance of taking the House, any of you are, uh, object to that? I'd say a little lower. A little lower. Though I think in the Senate they might have a little better. Than, here's the problem with the Senate. It's a huge debate. Historically speaking, they should pin, win the Senate if we have a terrible time at the top of the ticket. But Trump, like we had Cruz and it was an ideological lock all the way up and down in perception of voters, I think they'd knock us out of the Senate. The difference is Trump is seen as such an outlier that our Senate guys might be able to create their own identity. Yeah. That said, they're in tough states. Guys they're like Kirk, Kirk in Illinois. States. So Pat Toomey is doing a great job, but that's Pennsylvania, you know. So I would say still there's a little thumb on the scale. I'd say, I hate to say it, but a little better than 50. It's not clear that there are enough districts where Democrats have yeah. basically, you know, candidates ready to be competitive. On it, the House. It, on the House side, right? Um, yeah. uh, that they, uh, and a lot of this will look like, in retrospect, a recruiting failure, you know, that, that I think if you went back six months earlier and told uh, the House Democratic leadership, the, D, the DCCC, that there's a decent chance that Donald Trump would, will be the nominee, you would have found a whole lot more places where some local business person who can float a million dollar campaign or a county executive who's kind of ambitious would have said, yeah, I'll, I'll put my, you know, Republicans have a seven point advantage in this district, but, you know, fingers crossed if there's a wave. If, there, if a wave comes, I am, there might not just not be enough people who are, are plausibly lifted by it, um, and, and that, that could look, uh, if Hillary wins overwhelmingly and Democrats take back the Senate, um, and uh, Democrats sort of uh, institutionalize their advantage on the Supreme Court, um, you could see that being a, a, a huge point of, of disappointment for Democrats and something that looks like a major historical mm -hmm. missed opportunity for what would be two years of, of you know, sort of potentially unrivaled liberal governance. And if we're holding the House by only eight to nine in the caucus, the guys are going to get beat are Ryan's best guys. 
And so his caucus politics become a lot harder, though it's better to have a majority than not. So now let's beat up on the Democrats. So um, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, both successful politicians in many, many ways. Um, uh, not everyone would agree with this. I think Obama's presidency will ultimately be seen as quite successful. One way in which it's clearly been a failure is how basically every other Democrat has done in the country. Uh, state houses, governorships, uh, Congress. Some of those it feels like, look, the party in power often loses Congress. But Jen, why have Democrats been so ineffective at every level over the last decade, and in some ways two decades, um, other than the presidency and occasionally Congress? Yeah, I mean, I think we have systemic problems in terms of how we think about this and what we, we do about it. I mean, first of all, you know, our, our, our base voters, our, our electorate does not turn out at the same levels in off year that they do on year. Um, you know, I can tell you from 2014, having uh, worked on all the Democratic Senate races, um, when I did end up in the fetal position um, <laughs> afterwards, um, you know, th there was not a lack of organization. There was not a lack of the right tactics. There wasn't a lack of data. Um, but, you know, I think, one, there's some, the, some broad strokes that we have to address that are nationally, but also locally, race by race, we're struggling with, in, in part, the pipeline, the candidates that are running. We're struggling with um, our infrastructure in states to continue to build and mold a Democratic Party. Um, clearly, I think we've seen a bigger impact on the Democratic side with Citizens United and what's happening with the infrastructure and um, the work that we're doing the fact that it takes so much money to run for office and the type of people that are willing to put themselves out there. I think there's lots of pieces like this. But, you know, I also look at Colorado in 2014, and, you know, that's a place where, um, you know, you, you could argue we should not have lost that race. We had a strong incumbent. He was relatively popular, though unknown. Um, we had for the first time he ever... all Cory Gardner race. Yes, exactly. Um, we had a mail-in ballot um, for the first time ever, and you know that was, it's a big deal, although in Colorado in 2012, I think you had like 70% of people that were voting outside of election day, so there was already sort of culturally um, you know, people voting pretty regularly. Um, and so you know, we thought, okay, this is great. This, you know, we'll build a strong organization, we'll have the same playbook, we're really organized here. Um, and we ended up making very big mistakes. The first is we tried to run the 2010 playbook in 2014. We tried to, to go after Cory Gardner with uh, social issues, trying to reach women, um, and painting a very extremist picture. And the problem with that is that nobody believed it. Nobody bought that Cory Gardner was going to be the guy that was going to take, take away reproductive rights. Whether or not he had supported personhood in the past, it just was not believable. And it was not built for that race. So I think that really is something that we have to keep learning the lessons over and over again. There is not one cookie cutter approach to winning elections. There is not one Barack Obama model and one way to get the Obama coalition to support you. You really have to think about the electorate, the candidates, and what you're trying to do there. The other thing I'd say about 2014 in particular is, we really struggled with President Obama and whether or not he should go out there and organize. And you know, look, uh, hindsight is 2020, and certainly, um, you know, it, it, we are in an environment where people are not trusting of, of government, of big institutions, of people that are incumbents, and we certainly saw that. But we were taking the hit for the president and the people that did not like him, but we didn't use him at all. And so, in these close races. It's impossible to know if he was out there on the stump and organizing that that would have had the ultimate impact. But in places like North Carolina, where it was so close, where the president did not campaign, um, maybe we could have done a little bit more in turnout. Maybe we could have engaged people a little bit more. And while we had the downside, we could have had the upside. So I think those are some of the tactical things, but also some of the larger infrastructure, pipeline, candidates, and, and financing that we really struggle with. And you know, we've yet to come up with a real answer on how to solve. Just to interject, I've, I'm so old, I've been at this for a long time, and this reminds me, we, this fight always happens. In the midterm elections, when you've got the incumbent president and the numbers are down, the political people start saying, well, let's hide the most visible person in the world. <laughs> and in 82, when Ronald Reagan's numbers weren't so great, I was around in the 82 races, and I was just starting out, and that was the theory. You know, we can't send him to a state, it'll hurt. Well, they already know he's president, already <laughs> mad at him. Turn your weapon loose. And it was amusing to me to see the Obama people doing the same thing. Though I will say, there was something in the clear mountain water here. The, the, the Obama drop here is a little of an outlier. So Colorado was really mad at him. And that probably made it even harder. Cory Gardner was also the model of the kind of candidate we have to run in swing states. There's all this talk about Ohio. In many ways, Colorado's the most interesting swing state 
along with Florida, those three. Because it and they decide the presidential election. There are a million people in those three states who pick the president. Colorado is more interesting in some ways because it looks more like the future of the country. Well, a little bit. It's demographically interesting. Is that the people don't, maybe at least in my party, which is never sensitized enough to non-white voters, but the significant Latino vote here. You've got the bifurcation between the very modern Denver metroplex and then the western slope. It's just politically an interesting state. And, and, and you know, I mean, you talked about uh, white working, the, the potential for, for Trump gains and white working class voters, which would probably manifest itself in the Rust Belt most readily where you have um, the sort of largest proportion of those voters in the electorate. It's possible that we could end up with um, the beginning of some sort of realignment here where Rust Belt states that Democrats have carried going back basically to 1992 um, become uh, more favorable. And we see the expansion of, of the map um, as Democrats have been talking about for, um, for 15 years, but gets accelerated because of Trump where Georgia, Arizona, um, uh, actually become competitive, and and you know the the far end of that map, which could have long term ramifications for both parties, is if the libertarian ticket um, does well, not well enough to win, but if Gary Johnson is getting up to you know fifteen twenty percent of the vote, there are a whole lot of states, fairly conservative states, uh, Alaska, Idaho, Utah, where you know Hillary Clinton with thirty nine percent of the vote could win, <coughs> and these are states where there has not been a competitive uh, presidential election in. Um, a generation and sometimes like ever. So um, we could see, we'd, we'd become so used to the idea that there was basically a hardened map and a, and a shrinking pool of, of, um, of battleground states and, and we could see that uh, upended uh, really radically because of Trump. Some of the current, I mean, I don't put much weight on current poll numbers state by state, but some of the Utah poll numbers right now are remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that Utah looks semi-competitive. Well, yeah, look, Trump, you got to get 95% of your party generally, 94, 95 to do it right, particularly <coughs> in Republican. Romney did about 94, and even if Trump only does 85, you know, that is a significant problem for him, and he, that's where he is now. He's in the low 80s, and there's a lot of Trump yet to come. We just don't know. The most interesting thing to me is what does Hillary do, because she has a huge strategic choice. There's, she, with her VP pick and the rest of the things she'll do and the, the best messaging opportunity you get in life, being a presidential nominee. She's got the big microphone. She can tell a big story with it. Does she try to send dog whistles to the center, to conservative independents and Republicans falling off Trump? Or does she double down on the kind of Bernie Sanders wing of the party uh, to run a more base-oriented election? That's a pretty big call. Who would send the best dog whistles to conservatives and independents for a VP pick? Well, it's a small shopping list in the Democratic <coughs> Party. Um, and I hate the idea of giving advice to Hillary Clinton. But keep in mind, she's got to govern, too. I would, uh, I would tell Tim Kaine to go out there and invent himself as a great fiscal conservative. And then I, so when you pick him, you're sending an ideological signal, not just a loyalty signal. The problem is, if the story is loyalty, then everybody will say, why didn't she pick Huma? Couldn't clear the vetting. Uh, lo loyalty doesn't get you votes in your <laughs> vice presidential pick. You want a narrative that is about something that voters care about. And people are looking for fiscal conservatism in a reasonable way. She doubles down on Warren and, and that crowd. That's a gift to Trump. Lynn, you were going to come in. I, I wanted to go back to the, your question about uh, the Democratic Party and the midterm or yeah. sub-national elections. Um, and I, I actually think that a little bit of what's happening has to do with the groups that are stakeholders in the two parties and how differently they're built. And so on the right, you can think of uh, the business community or the big churches. And they want something from their legislators. They have policies they care about. And when it comes time to think about nominating candidates and getting someone to run for the state house or the state senate or even Congress, they can very easily go into those groups and find someone, as Sasha said, a business guy who has a million bucks to spend. But also, those groups are well organized. And you know, back in the day, it would have been a phone tree. Um, but now, like, they all know how to reach each other. And they're used to coming together to do things to get what they want for their interests. If you think about what the comparable, comparable groups are in the Democratic Party, there are groups, but they are much more identity-based. So Emily's list is the one that comes to mind for me. It's really well organized, wants to run candidates, but f women. And then there are ethnic groups. And again, we can get them to the phone banks to make phone calls, but the group is a fundamentally different kind of group than those stakeholding groups on the right. 
And I just think that there's probably something there in terms of being able to find people who are willing to run for office. And then, you know, in a crowded primary for a Congress seat that's open, you know, that kind of a coalition, I think, can sometimes make a difference. Hmm. I just throw in public employee unions. <laughs> I remember when I was working for Arnold, when the Democratic speaker knew they were on the line, jumped to the window to answer the call. I, I, yeah, we could talk about let's, it. Let's, hear from, let's yeah. hear from all of you. Yeah, exactly. Sir, all the way in the back <laughs> here. We've got some <coughs> microphones circulating. Hi, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about gerrymandering and why people aren't more aware at the community level and at the grassroots level of how gerrymandering really affects the power of their vote? It seems like one of the biggest stories, given how few seats are, for example, up for grabs in Congress this election, given all of the changes, all the voices, at the end of the day, because of how districts are, are cut up, there's actually very little that most people might be able to actually affect, and why don't they understand that? So I'd love to just get your thoughts on that. Lynn, you want to go first? Well, I was just going to say one of the great experiments is California going to a citizen group that's drawing the districts. And, um, you know, the early research that's coming back on that is, is having a hard time demonstrating that whether you have interested parties drawing the districts or a group of citizens who are nonpartisan, who are not stakeholders drawing the districts, that, that we're having a hard time finding that it's making much difference. Um, and of course, there are lots of different ways you can measure whether your vote is effective, as you said. Um, so a little bit of it depends on, on what you think wasting a vote means. But this isn't, I, I don't think that the, that the problem is as clear as is, as it seems like it should be. I mean, I think gerrymandering clearly matters. Um, it clearly, if you have one party drawing the lines, but I don't think it's as important as a lot of Democrats think it is. <laughs> I think the big sort is more important. The fact that essentially, to exaggerate a little bit, every liberal in the country has moved to Brooklyn um, is a bigger problem for Democrats than how Republicans have drawn the lines. And even if you had someone who sat down in a lot of these states and said, I'm going to draw the map most favorable to Democrats, they would have a really hard time taking some of those voters in Brooklyn and putting them in a congressional district that includes Buffalo. And so the fact that people are more interested in living around people who are similar to them, I'm not saying gerrymandering doesn't matter. It does. The Democrats in Illinois draw the lines differently from the way the Republicans do in Pennsylvania. But it's not just gerrymandering. It's also the fact that people want to live increasingly with people like them. Yeah, no, I fundamentally, the big factors drive a lot of it. Iowa has the best system. It's purely technocratic. But they, because of Iowa's population demographics, don't run into some of the civil rights issues, too, about you have to create minority districts. or it, it, that, that does have a, a thumb on the scale, the idea that minority, majority, whatever districts are something that must be done. The other problem is the incentives are to do it. I used to live in a district in California that was only contiguous at low tide uh, that the Dems drew. So I would go you know, work for politicians on the Republican side, and what's the first thing political acts want to do? Get even. So in Michigan, we used to try to always take Sandy Levin's district and draw it into Canada. And uh, you know, we had some interesting maps. So it's a hard cycle to break. Generally, when you poll voters, they like the idea of registering a form. But it's a process issue, so it's never at the top of what they're interested in. And most Democratic incumbents don't want to see yeah. their districts redrawn, right? They're winning with 85% of the vote, and they don't yeah. want to give away 20% so of the votes. That's so true. Everybody's willing to make a deal to cover their own ass. Ma'am, right here in the front. Thank you. There seems to be a consensus, as there we've seen in the polls, that Hillary will win the election. Can you envision anything that any single event, precipitous or otherwise, that would prevent that from happening? Yeah. I mean, I had a sort of working list of six external events that I thought could, uh, you know, perhaps dramatically change things, and some sort of major uh, financial shock, an economic crisis, terrorist attack. I had some money on major Mexican gang violence, uh, Hillary Health Scare maybe, and certainly anything related sure. to the FBI. Um, we've already seen kind of two of those play out in the last few weeks, or at least the potential for two of those. A major terrorist attack in the US, obviously now another major one overseas, but, um, <coughs> and at least the, some economic anxiety coming out of Brexit, although I think it'll take a while to sort of see whether there are long-term impacts on, on Americans as investors or workers or consumers. Um, and there's no uh, immediate sign that either of those politically has, has redounded to Trump's benefit. 
Um, and that may be because of how each of the candidates have presented themselves. It may also be because of how Trump has responded in those situations. So I'm, I'm becoming less and less convinced that if there is a major you know, exogenous shock to this race, that if voters become risk averse um, or fearful or, or um, more willing to take a risk, that it's clear to me that that, that necessarily hurts Hillary. Um, but I think that those are the kind of the terms we should think of, like you know, major geopolitical events. The only thing I'd add is we said 90%, or I did. That's not 100, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, right. for any baseball fans in the audience, about 10% of plate appearances end with an extra base hit. People don't think about a double, a triple, or a home run as being some crazy event. And 10% is a real chance. So please don't hear us saying Hillary's sure to win. <laughs> yeah. And she I think thinking about it that way is the thing she can do, that yeah. everyone can do that could hurt. Yeah. It's <clears throat> unlikely, but nothing's impossible. And a black swan is never impossible. It's about um, whether you believe, any of you, particularly Mike Murphy, if the Republican leaders who are, I think, cynically getting behind Trump, will that in the long run hurt the party or help it? Um, one, I, it, this is an interesting question. You know, we're in an era now of internet politics. If this were the Roosevelt election and basically newspaper publishers or front page editorials had the most power in politics, uh, I'm a Roosevelt man, the party's for Roosevelt. They, you define the party that way. Now we know everything about these candidates. We know Paul Ryan is squirming every time Trump comes up. We know Mitch McConnell said, yeah, I guess I'm for him, and then shuffles away. All the secondary level of information that people know, I'll, I'll prove it. The Republican logo for years was called the Jack Frost Elephant, that red, white, and blue round elephant named after Jack Frost, the famous guy, designed the Pan Am logo, too, after Watergate. Well, the new Republican logo is a squirming politician trying to avoid the Trump question. <laughs> Now, half of you laughed at that because you know it's true, because you've seen them squirm on television or the internet. So that is a distance that didn't exist in the old days. So, and it's easy, Vin Weber made this point yesterday, he's right, it's easy for us. I'm just a loud mouth with a podcast. And it's easy for me to say I'm never gonna vote for Trump and Trump's terrible and run Radio Free GOP soon to be on iTunes. <laughs> but people who are actually elected and are wrangling, and I'm very proud of Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney, but neither are holding current office. I'm super proud of Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, who's going to be up for a hell of a primary because his ass is on the ballot and he's taking the stand. So there are some that are ultimately brave, but I kind of understand the wiggling. And we, we haven't had this where we've asked party leaders to disavow their fair and square elected nominee. We now have more than 700 delegates trying to get a convention clause passed where they can vote their own hearts, which means not for Trump. So there, there's about as much of a rebellion going on as you're ever going to see. Finally, Trump after this will have the same future impact that former President Mike Dukakis. I, I was with Romney two days ago. He's a good friend of mine on Sloan Beach. And it was time to leave, and we, he had trouble flagging a cab down. Mm -hmm. you know, so the idea that he now has this grip over the party, if you lose, you melt away pretty quickly. The less optimistic answer for Republicans, I would say, is that politics has what social scientists call generational cohort effects, that how you start voting when you're 18 or 20 That's can true. cast an extremely long shadow. People who were, who were brought in by Reagan have remained Republicans, many of them their whole life. And to Lynn's point about Latinos, it's not just about Latinos. There could be ways in which Trump does cast a long shadow that I assume is part of the reason you're starting Radio F for a year. Can I just add to, <laughs> I actually think there's a bigger impact here, which is trust. And it's the same thing that I was talking about in 2014 when we weren't using the president out there to campaign when everyone knew our candidates were with the president. When you see people like Ryan, who, you know, there's a lot of respect for him on both sides of the aisle, you know, really have to stomach supporting someone that you know just from the way he's doing it that he's not there. I think that says a lot. And I think that's a fundamental problem we have with government and with young people saying, why on earth would I run for office? Why would I go through this? Because you know, why do I want to put myself in that situation? And, you know, I, I think it's, it's a fundamental undercurrent that we all have to solve on both sides, that this is bringing out to the forefront more than it normally is. Yeah, feeding more cynicism Let's, is true. Finally, I'll just say, Trump has did something yesterday that's been the biggest single thing since he's been the apparent nominee. He's declared war on the TPP, which has driven a, driven a huge schism with the U.S. Chamber, National Association of Manufacturers, stalwart Republican groups. And if he puts them up for grabs, that is a franchise change. That the trade thing that could stick and it could hurt us for a long time. Sir, uh, hi, Mr. Murphy. 
Yes. Um, According to the uh, William Crystal, the, yeah. cu the culture wars are over and you lost. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought he was working on invading Syria right now. Okay. I didn't know Bill <laughs> the, moved the, over to that. The, the, I'm a disaffected Republican. <laughs> the litmus test for being a Republican is how religious you are, being against abortion. Um, and until those sort of things change, um, I think that uh, the party is going to have a hard time. And so I think that uh, you should take a hard look at why the 16 very best candidates the Republicans had to offer got beat by what you guys call a complete nitwit. Well, he's got something. What does he have? Yeah. I think you need to look inside because you're just part of the establishment and the party's going to die unless you guys change. Well, I am part of the establishment. Trump won because he got voters who had the most alienation from the system. We know a lot about Trump voters, actually. And it was enough to win the nomination. What state are you from? Texas. Texas. Yeah, he won that primary. Beat your home state senator, Ted Cruz, who's, yeah, who's popular there. So, you know, I, I'm a guy who has such tremendous power, I get to control exactly one vote in the Republican primary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, I, you know, in California. Uh, so I take your point. What Trump was a grievance candidate, and there's a huge market. People want to beat up the entire political system. They want to beat up the establishment. So Trump was the club to do it. And it was kind of a lost weekend. It was a lot of fun to blow everything up and, and, and vote for Trump. And now we'll, we'll have the second half of the story. And then I think Republican primary voters, including the 13 million who voted for Trump, after the election will sit back and decide, you know, did they get what they wanted? Because their vote had the power. And they got the power to run the place. I mean, that, Trump did this with 13 million voters. You know how many people vote in the general election? 128, 126, 128 million. So, you know, the Trump thing's half over, and we'll see how it turns out. So, you know, I don't want to sound contemptuous to Trump voters, but, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I think people know what Trump's saying, so if you vote for it, then you've got to own it. There is no panel that's more important to end on time than the 1020 panel because it allows you to get to the hot dog stand on time. So thank you very much to our panel, and thank you to all of you.